When I came back to the United States, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. Bernays returned to New York and set up as a public relations council in a small office off Broadway. It was the first time the term had ever been used. Since the end of the 19th century, America had become a mass industrial society, with millions clustered together in the cities. Bernays was determined to find a way to manage and alter the way these new crowds thought and felt. To do this, he turned to the writings of his uncle Sigmund. While in Paris, Bernays had sent his uncle a gift of some Havana cigars. In return, Freud had sent him a copy of his general introduction to psychoanalysis. Bernays read it, and the picture of hidden irrational forces inside human beings fascinated him. This series is about how those in power have used Freud's theories to try and control the dangerous crowd in an age of mass democracy. At the heart of the story is not just Sigmund Freud, but other members of the Freud family. This episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on the 20th century was nearly as great as his uncle's. Because Bernays was the first person to take Freud's ideas about human beings and use them to manipulate the masses. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Out of this would come a new political idea of how to control the masses. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. It was the start of the all-consuming self which has come to dominate our world today. Bernays set out to experiment with the minds of the popular classes. His most dramatic experiment was to persuade women to smoke. At that time there was a taboo against women smoking and one of his early clients, George Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Corporation, asked Bernays to find a way of breaking it. A. A. Brill was one of the first psychoanalysts in America and for a large fee he told Bernays that cigarettes were a symbol of the penis and of male sexual power. He told Bernays that if he could find a way to connect cigarettes with the idea of challenging male power, then women would smoke, because then they would have their own penises. Every year, New York held an Easter Day parade to which thousands came, and Bernays decided to stage an event there. He persuaded a group of rich debutantes to hide cigarettes under their clothes. Then, they should join the parade, and at a given signal from him, they were to light up the cigarettes dramatically. Bernays then informed the press that he had heard that a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up what they called torches of freedom. A symbol, women, young women, debutantes, smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this, because torches of freedom. Every metaphor and analogy has to come from somewhere. Perhaps they are rare pearls that drop from the pens of an elite corps of bards and scribblers and then are hoarded by a grateful populace. But given their prevalence in language, it seems more likely that they are the natural products of the way everyone's mind works. And so the next day, this was not just in all of the New York papers, it was across the United States and around the world. And from that point forward, uh, the sale of cigarettes to women began to rise. He had made them socially acceptable with a single symbolic act. Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product 
was not to sell it to your intellect that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. What the corporations realized they had to do was transform the way the majority of Americans thought about products. One leading Wall Street banker, Paul Mazur of Lehman Brothers, was clear about what was necessary. We must shift America, he wrote, from a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things even before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. In 1939, New York hosted the World's Fair. Edward Bernays was a central advisor. He insisted that the theme be the link between democracy and American business. At the heart of the fair was a giant white dome that Bernays named Democracy. And the central exhibit was a vast working model of America's future, constructed by the General Motors Corporation. To my father, the World's Fair was an opportunity to keep the status quo, that is, capitalism, in a democracy. It was consumerist, but at the same time, you inferred that in a funny way, democracy and capitalism went together. The World's Fair was an extraordinary success and captured America's imagination. The vision it portrayed was of a new form of democracy in which business responded to people's innermost desires in a way politicians could never do. But it was a form of democracy that depended on treating people not as active citizens as Roosevelt did, but as passive consumers. Because this, Bernays believed, was the key to control in a mass democracy. It's not that the people are in charge, but that the people's desires are in charge. The people are not in charge. The people exercise no decision-making power within this environment. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to the idea of the public as passive consumers. Oh! Driven primarily by instinctual or unconscious desires, and that if you can in fact trigger those needs and desires, you can get what you want from them. Oh!